Hey, Richard Flint, and I want to welcome you to this episode of Let's Talk Human Behavior. You know, this week I've been doing some writing on uh, life and choices. And it's interesting because every day of your life is really about the choices that you make. And every time you make a choice, uh, that's a decision. And with that decision, you implement through a pathway that that decision creates. Now, it's interesting because whatever that pathway is, is not defined by the choice you made. It's actually defined by the behavior you bring to that choice. Over the years, I've found so many people who make a choice, and then what happens is their behavior contradicts the choice that they've made. So what's the result of that? They live in confusion. Ask anyone who knows me anywhere around the world where I've been and ask them, what do you remember about that guy? And I promise you, they're gonna tell you three words. Behavior never lies. So when I came up with this concept of doing this podcast, I wanted to have a title to it that represented who I am, what I do, and the basis of my teachings. So the thing I kept coming back to was those three words, behavior never lies. Because the real definition of whom you are is not what you say, it's what you do. So that's where the idea of let's talk human behavior came from. Um, I have found over the years in doing counseling and coaching and mentoring that the greatest point of confusion in the human life is when their words are contradicted by their behavior. Now, with that as a thought, our show today is going to concentrate on one word, success. And what an interesting, interesting word. You know, it's something everybody wants. But in all reality, it's something very, very few people ever get to achieve. Why? Because of their behavior. And I want to focus on that word today. And my guest today is Jim Sabellico. And I'm happy to have him. He and I did a little pre-talk. And I was impressed by what I heard from him. So, Jim, I want to welcome you to Let's Talk Human Behavior. And I know my listeners probably don't know you and they wouldn't recognize you in a crowd. So why don't you tell us about you and tell us about your journey and how sure, that leads to. into the success you've had in your life. Yeah, I would uh, I would love to. First, I just obviously want to honor you for, for having me here and bringing this up because it's it's such an important topic and uh, it's success is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, a little bit about me and my background. I started my first business when I was eight years old, um, which sounds kind of silly, but uh, it was cutting grass around the neighborhood, making a couple hundred bucks a week as an eight-year-old uh, was pretty good money at the time. And and that early, uh, what I deemed success, right? Having a little bit of money in my pocket as an eight-year-old kid with no expenses made me feel great, made me feel alive, free. I could do whatever I wanted. And that really lit a fire in me that that kind of continued through my early childhood, my teen years. And uh, I've been uh, sort of nonstop on a roll working for myself since then. Now, through that time, I've, I've had a lot of experiences with chasing that initial version of success where it was money, the house, the car, the things that most people typically associate with success that they see on social media. Um, and it got to a point where I had uh, had our first child, Joseph, my son. And uh, <clears throat> for me, my identity was based in what I thought was success in business. And so what wound up happening was I continued down that road and I, I made decision after decision based on pursuing this version of success I thought I had, uh, ultimately bringing me closer to near divorce, no relationship with my kids, uh, until I got to this one night, my son's fifth birthday, when I came home from work uh, about 8.40 at night, 
I was doing something I deemed was important at the time, which in retrospect, I obviously couldn't even tell you what it was, but there was some type of important thing that I had to do, which was more important than being home for my family. So when I finally got home, I wanted to sing happy birthday to my son and my wife brings out the birthday cake and it's already half gone. And uh, this moment I will never forget. It's literally the wallpaper of my phone right here. It's a picture of my son and daughter sitting there in front of a half eaten birthday cake. They're trying their best to stay awake and to smile and to be happy, but they're falling asleep. And in that moment, as I'm sitting there, I realized this is not success. Like I'm not successful. Sure. I've got money. I've got a house, a nice car, but like I'm, I missed seeing happy birthday to my kid and I'll never get that experience back. Uh, so in that moment, <clears throat> I took that picture and I realized I'm going to assign some meaning to this moment. We're going to make a change to the decisions and the behaviors that come after it to really make a proper version of success. And I, I keep this picture as my wallpaper, as a daily reminder of <clears throat> every decision that I make. I never want to have a no half cake moment again. So when my kids come and say, Hey dad, will you play with me in the yard? Or will you go do this? Or whatever these life experiences are. I remember that no half cakes. And I remember that the decision that I'm making right now, am I going to look back on and regret, right? Is it the email that I'm going to reply to more important than going to have an experience with my family or going to do whatever it might be. And uh, to me, that's why I wanted to speak on this topic. It's, it's so critically important to really prioritize the right version of success, right? Understanding what success really means in your life and how your behaviors and your decisions kind of tie together with that. So where are you today? Um, physically what, what, in New York. What drives you today? <laughs> what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What is it that makes you want to want to go, want to achieve, want to accomplish? What is it? It's a mixture between possibility and legacy. Um, and each one of those has a little bit of a different version to it. But for one, it's it's if I die tomorrow, no amount of money or house or car or whatever I can leave my family or anyone that's close to me, that can all also be gone in a couple of days. But to me, I feel like if I leave one person with a different outlook, a different perspective, if I give them one nugget of information that might change the course of their life, that drives me. The possibility that I can have a conversation that you and I could be here talking together on this and one person can listen to it and slightly change their next decision and impact their family and then their community and their generations after that, because we decided to come here and pour out of us, right? And, and give from ourselves for that possibility. And the possibility part is to me, if we can prove something is possible, if we can push ourselves as hard as possible and achieve these things and go out of the way to create this legacy, it gives other people no excuse that it's not possible. So to me, going through and, and, leaving that legacy and, and creating things that are possible for the people around us is what really gets me out of bed in the morning. You know, Jim, I, I, I like that thought because if you could walk around my house here, you would find that there's sticky notes in certain places. And there's just one statement on those sticky notes. And it's what drives me every single day of my life. And it simply says, somebody's going to need me today. And I spend every day of my life not running, uh, but searching. I spend every day of my life not just hearing, but listening. Uh, because what you just said is so powerful. If we can have an impact on just one person, and that impact we have on that person then allows them to have a, a, a discovery point in their life. And they share that aha moment with others. Then what we do is we create a legacy. Um, have 16 philosophies, not pretty philosophies, but laws that drive my life. And one of those simply says that in my life, I want to have a positive presence that is present when I'm not present. And, uh, you know, 
when I look at when I look at life, I I think that foundation, one of the parts of the foundation of our life is what drives us. And I, I think what you said, the possibility and the legacy. But you take those two and you put them into an understanding. Uh, they're really created by three Ds, your desire, your determination, and your discipline. So it is, if you were to define your desire right now in Jim's life, what would it be? Would it be the, the possibility and the legacy or does it go deeper than that? I think it's fairly related to that. Um, you may have heard other people explain this before, but uh, to me, I believe, you know, when I, when I eventually do pass and I meet the person that I could have been, right, the ultimate possible version of myself, I want to be as close as humanly possible to that maxed out version of me. And that pushes me every day to, to be a little bit better, to, to make a decision right now that's going to be 1% better tomorrow. And, uh, you know, not having a goal of I'm going to be in this spot on this timeline because your goals are always going to change. But, you know, I think for me, it's always going to be how can I do a thing today that's going to get me 1% better tomorrow? And uh, I honestly don't know what the, the maximum possibility is, right? It depends on how long I'm here, but it's always going to be improving 1% tomorrow from today. And uh, with that, I, I want to bring people along for the ride. Like, <clears throat> I believe one of our, our family principles is everything you touch, every place you go, and everyone you meet, leave it better than you found it. So to me, I believe that if we're involved in a thing, whether it's a sports team or we go to the grocery store and on our way in, we bring in whatever carts we see in the parking lot, because that's that little extra bit that we can do to, to help the community, the store, the business, whoever. But it's that little extra bit that we can pour in every single day. And I think that ultimately brings you much closer to your, your maximum possibility. Yeah. I, I, one of my thoughts is that everywhere I go, I want to leave my thumbprint. Uh, I have a, a friend that builds houses. And, and when he was first starting his building company, I told him, here's what you need to do. You pick one room in every house. And when you're painting, you go in that room and you put your thumbprint in it. And that thumbprint is your definition of you. It's your definition of, of whom you really are. So if, if, if Jim looks at his life right now, does he consider himself to be successful? No. Okay. Why? Not done yet. Okay. Do you have to come? Do you have to be done to feel successful? I think the difference of feeling successful and being successful are a bit different, right? I'm, I'm pleased with where I am in my life right now, but I know I'm not done yet. Okay. Right? So I know that there's more. So I, I, I'm not reached the point where I feel like I'm successful. I'm good. I can coast from here on out what i'm trying to say i am very satisfied with the things that i've accomplished up until now but there is more potential and it, it doesn't leave me feeling like i could take a day off from being the person that i am from intentionally influencing the people around me from pouring into them right so it's i'm pleased with where i am i, I feel like i've done successful things but i'm not yet reached a point of success and i don't know that i'll ever reach it it's it's going to be a continual uh, chase for that for the rest of my life yeah you're using one of my one of my things that i try to get people to understand because people don't understand that no matter where you are there's always more uh, there's another step there's another stage there's another possibility there's another opportunity but so many times what happens is success sometimes can become exhausting right yes what what wears you out the most about your success journey? What takes the most energy out of you? When you forget that the thing you're supposed to enjoy is the process, not the destination. Because I think that's what a lot of people trip up on. 
the trip up on the fact that <clears throat> you should be loving the process of getting there more than the than the actual destination because when you're in it every day and you love what you do and and you really enjoy the time you spend pouring into other people or doing whatever it is that you do right if you're a street sweeper a custodian cheesemaker whatever if you really genuinely love what you do and you pour your heart into it it's the process of doing it not the end result right for the lion it's the hunt not the meal at the end they enjoy the process yeah, it goes back to something you said when you were telling us about you, that there was a point in your life where you were driven by things. And the interesting thing about things is there's always more things to want. There's another shiny object out there. And so many times when you get that shiny object, it's not what you thought it was going to be. So, and I've learned this in people, when, when we're driven by things, we're actually setting ourselves up for disappointment because the thing can never really satisfy us because it's not what we're really after. Right. So what are you after? <clears throat> Impact. Okay. Legacy. You know, I think it's, it's <clears throat> the process of when I go to bed at night and I look back on the things I've done that day, have I given all that I could to make a positive impact in the people that I spoke to and the people that I met and the people that I interacted with the places I was, <clears throat> did I, did I give everything I have in order to make those people feel loved, seen, heard, appreciated? And, uh, that's it. It's a, it's a daily rinse and repeat. Just so, continuing to, to grow beyond that. So what's next for Jim? You're, you like where you are. You're happy where you are. Are you fulfilled with what, with what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> do you feel a sense of freedom that in doing what you do, you can actually become the authentic you? Yes. Okay. So 100%. what's next? What's next for Jim? What's on the horizon? Uh, multiplication. So, <clears throat> you know, I've, I'm not at maximum knowledge yet, right? I don't think you'd even say you are, right? We all have this pursuit of more. But I, I do feel I've reached a certain point where I have enough information to start creating, a, you know, a bit of a, an internal tribe of people with that same mindset, with that same uh, disciplines, with the same understanding to then go out and then lead their own tribes. So for me in this stage right now, what I'm looking to do and, and what I'm really focusing on is, is finding people and bringing them in to this understanding this mindset and and building that community of people who then want to go out and lead on their own. So it's uh whether you want to call it discipleship or leadership, you know, creating more people to go out and, and kind of keep fulfilling the same mindset. Yeah, I like the word discipleship. You know, uh my background in theology, I always was marveled at how Christ picked the 12 that he picked and all their variants. And all he asked them to do was go out and multiply right. and, and share. Uh, and, and that's just such a critical part. When, when, when you put your mind in gear and you think about success, how do you define it? I would say success to me is living your life to the maximum possible and enjoying every minute along the way. Like not living in regret, not living in fear, not living in what if, uh, you know, pouring your whole heart into every decision you make, being relentlessly authentic and being satisfied with the result. That's an interesting definition. Uh, because how challenging is it to stay focused on improving? I mean, do you ever get distracted? Yeah, definitely. What's the what's the number one thing that can distract you? Um, hmm. I think the number one thing is is sometimes you get into a spot where you feel like you're not doing enough. 
and you need to to stop and and look at perspective on on where you are compared to where you were a couple of years ago. Um, for me, sometimes I'll get into a spot where I feel like I could or should be doing more, and uh, that could be a very distracting mindset because you know sometimes when you do a thing for long enough and it becomes habit and it becomes just routine, no matter even if that that discipline that you have now is light years ahead of where you were a couple of years ago. Um, now it's normal. So you don't feel like it's an achievement anymore. And and you start to think maybe I'm not doing enough. Um, so spending time with yourself and really understanding, Hey, where are you, where have you been and where are you going? I think is, is really important for resetting that. Yeah. You consider yourself a driven person. Yes. And one of the things I've learned in, in studying human behavior is that driven people sometimes are tough on their self. So are you tough on you? Yeah, I would say yes. And sometimes when we're tough, we get disappointed in ourselves because we, we, we're not up to the maximum point where we want to be at this moment. Right. So when you, when you get tough on yourself and all of a sudden you get disappointed with yourself because all of us do, how do you handle that? How do you get back in sync with Jim? Uh, a couple of things. One is I'll, I'll usually journal that thought. So whether that's in writing or in video form, um, I'll often record videos to myself, just holding a phone, talking to myself about what I'm feeling in that moment. Um, usually thereafter, I'll also go back to a video from a month ago, a year ago, and look at where I was in that moment and then reflect on where I was and, and what changed beyond that. Uh, the other thing which really kind of resets and fills me up is to go out and just do something that I enjoy that I don't have to think about, whether that's going to play with my kids or it's going to design something on the computer or, you know, whatever it is, something that uh, I really enjoy. And I, it's not for anyone else, but just for me. I like that because that's one of the things that most people don't understand. I, I'm a person, Jim, that believes you live in four rooms in your life. You have business, family, social, and personal. And I think the definition of success can be different in each of those rooms. And, you know, uh, to me, when most people build their life, when I look at the design of their life, uh, their business is their number one room, families two, socials three, and personals four. And when I work with people, I try to help them understand that's a wrong design for your life. It's got to be personal, family, business, social. And what I found in most people is that they don't have that personal room. That personal room is where you go to be by yourself. Right. Yeah, sometimes, well, in that personal room, that's where every dream you'll ever have in your life is born. You know, how many creative ideas have you had when you've been alone with you? Almost all of them. Yeah. And, but, and, but you can't live in that personal room because you, you, <laughs> You'll mentally come apart if you don't, if you can't shut your mind off. Right. So that concept of reset is so important. And, you know, you, when, when you go to your family, because it, it looks like, and it sounds like that with that realization of that half of a cake, that really was a reset for you. Yes. That you looked at that cake and you realized what your prior priority had been and you looked at what that cake represented and it had to represent disappointment as a father it had to represent the realization i'm out of whack and it, it had to be a, a, a time where you made a shift right yeah so right now as a father and as a husband, do you feel successful? Yes. Why? What? What makes you feel that? <clears throat> I think it's it's little things for me. Um, <clears throat> it's the lessons that are that are caught, not taught, which to me make me understand that it's working, that it's not. there are some things which I will hear secondhand or I will 
uh, just happened to oversee somewhere else where I'm not necessarily involved, but I'll witness something my kids did or a behavior that they exhibit, which we've never had the conversation directly, but they've seen mom and dad do. They've seen it become normal in our house. They've seen how, how we lead our family. And then they go and do that with their friends, right? And they're only nine and six years old. So they're still little kids. But to see them out in the world, my wife is the president of our PTA. God bless her. She volunteers all of her time for those freaking kids. She spends a lot of time in the school. I spend a lot of time helping her there as much as I can. So we get to be involved in their daily school ongoings and we see how they operate in that school. We see who they make friends with, how they treat the people who are sitting alone at the cafeteria table. <clears throat> and those are things that, to me as a father, I feel proud of them for that behavior. You know, I feel like the, the lessons that they've received from us, the things that we exhibit in our house, they received. And to me, being a successful father means raising children who are self-confident, who are proud of who they are, who are comfortable, who are unafraid to fail, and who are willing to be relentless, relentlessly authentic. So now if I've done a good job as a father and I've raised those kids and I've done a good job as a husband, I've created an environment where my daughter can look up to me mm. and say, when I grow up, I want a husband that treats me the way that I treat my wife. My son can look at me and say, I'm going to treat my wife that way. And my wife can feel proud knowing that I love her to the, to the maximum of my ability and those kids and will give them a role model that they deserve. So those are things that make me feel successful as a father and a husband. With that said, I know that there's more. So I'm happy with where I'm at, but we're going to keep going. Can I, can I dig in and ask you a couple more questions about this? Please do. Because I think this is important for people to hear. There's a difference between hearing and listening. And when, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm really seeing some things. Because I think that half cake opens you up to not hearing but listening. And sometimes what we need to listen to is not the words of people, it's the behavior of people. So would you say that one of your strengths as a father is that you have and are learning to listen to your children through their behavior? Yes. And that's, that's the greatest message they send you? Yes. And, and when you're listening to them and, and what happens is you see in their behavior a need for time with you because they'll, exp they'll express that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of times, uh, you know, as a parent, I think you see your kids when they're maybe the words that are coming out of their mouth are I'm tired or I'm exhausted or I'm yelling at you for some silly reason because I dropped a crayon on the floor or whatever it is. But their behavior is showing that they're uh, overly stimulated or they, they need, you know, some solo time or whatever their, whatever their issue might be at that moment. You know, I think learning to understand their behavior and not necessarily the words coming out of their mouth really gives you a better insight into why, like what's really going on. Yeah. I'm a person who believes there's always an agenda behind the agenda. And you'll only hear, you'll only, you'll only listen or understand that behavior uh, be, that creates that agenda when you can slow down and listen beyond the words to the behavior. You you talked about when you were telling us about us uh, that you almost went through a divorce. Right. What caused that? Lack of identity. Um, in, I was 27 when we had our first kid. And my wife is a super mom. Like you can give her any kid in the world. And she will have that kid happy and asleep and giggling, whatever, within minutes. It's just, it's her God-given gift. She is amazing at it. I didn't have that gift. My gift was 
in the business realm. So for me, uh, once we had our first kid, I didn't know what to do with a newborn. I couldn't breastfeed the baby. I didn't really know what was going on. So I was like, all right, you are amazing at this. I'm going to go do what I'm good at. I'll go out in the world. I'll go make money and provide for you guys. You stay at home. I'll provide for you. You could be a stay-at-home mom. You take care of and raise our kids. And I leaned way too heavy in that because that was my identity was not as a successful father and husband, but as a successful business person. So in that moment, what I did was I leaned in really heavy on business and I basically left her to be a single mom. So while I wasn't out chasing women, gambling, doing whatever else, I would leave the house at three o'clock in the morning and come home at eight o'clock at night. But she had spent every ounce of her energy taking care of these kids. And we had no relationship. She was exhausted. You know, we resented each other in that moment for no reason. Uh, so <clears throat> part of that no half cakes moment was realizing that I wasn't being successful as a father and as a husband and my priorities and my definitions were all wrong. So from that, we really, you know, communicated more, changed the, the, the identities of ourselves to really not be successful as a business person, but be successful as a father and a husband and the business served that, right? It wasn't the other way around. Uh, so that's really kind of how that all fleshed out. You know, it's interesting because, you know, there's so many people, Jim, that go through what you're talking about. And that's why I think um, I appreciate your openness to share at this because it's all about success. And, you know, like what you were talking about, I think sometimes as a man, we think our definition of showing love is to provide things for the family. And if I provide things for the family, then you should understand I'm doing this because I love you. Right. But the number one thing that a human wants to know is that they matter. And, you know, I, I think the, the reset you're talking about here is the realization that goes back to something, again, that you talked about, that when, you know, you were eight years old when you started cutting grass and you know, that, that success at, at doing something and the way of work really pushed you. And so you were saying to your, your wife, I, I'll show you that I love you because I'll just, I'll provide more and more things. Right. And yet what she was looking for was not things. She was looking for presence. Correct. Of you being there. Uh, on a scale of one to 10 right now, uh, one being dysfunctional, 10 being very functional. Where would you put your, your relationship with your wife? I would put it at a nine. That's an amazing guy. I'm proud Thank of you. you. I'm proud Thank of you. It's a, it's a very continual process that we, we spend a lot of time intentionally communicating, working on things that are uncomfortable having a very lot of uncomfortable conversations, but it's important. Are you open to that? Yeah, absolutely. Will you bring them up sometimes or does she have to bring them up? We both do. So it's, it's a partnership. Yes. Yeah. I used to work on a church staff and I did a lot of wedding ceremonies. And one of the things I would never say is that marriage is two people becoming one. Because if you take that, it means I have to give up something in order to take care of you. But marriage is a partnership. And, you know, sometimes you're the leader, sometimes she's the leader. Right. But it's that it's that something, it's that respect that you have for each other that allows each of you to be authentic in the relationship. Most relationships, you look inside them and the people are not authentic. Right. And so they never know what the relationship is all about. Do you and your wife still date, even though you have two children? Yes. Once a week at minimum. And what's a normal date? <laughs> uh, I don't know that I've ever had a normal date, but uh, <laughs> it could be anything from, you know, we're going to go play trivia at the local bar to we're going to go grab a coffee and walk around Target for an hour. Uh, it's it's really what I would define as intentional time together. Hmm. I like that. I like that. In business, you feel successful, even though you know there's more. Yes. Okay. 
in, in your puzzle of business right now, is there any piece that's missing? Is there anything you're searching for that you haven't found yet? I don't think so. Okay. So you know where you're headed? Yes. And you have a, a clear plan of how you're going to get there? Yes. And you're passionate about what you're doing? Yes. Okay. What happens if in the process of searching, finding, discovering the more, what happens to Jim if he trips and he falls? How does he get back up? What gets him back up? Habit, I'd say, is probably number one. Uh, discipline. Understanding that all of the the best things in my life have happened to the, as the result of failure. Um, you know, I think I have the benefit of being <clears throat> in business for myself for a long time in lots of different ways, failing a lot. And every single one of those failures I can think of, the comeback was always better. Version 2.0 was always better than version one in almost every instance. So, you know, there, there have been a lot of times where there's been crushing failures you know, where I'll, I'll have an idea that I think is amazing or I'll invest a ton of money and then wind up losing it or whatever the situation may be. And I'll allow myself to feel the feeling for the day. I'm not going to deny myself to feel upset or feel frustrated or whatever the case may be, but I'm not going to live there. So I'll, I'll visit the feeling of being upset and, and feel the frustrations of everything went, that went wrong. But then we're going to stop, we're going to reset, we're going to say, all right, what happened? How did this happen? How do we, what can we learn from version two? And then what steps can I take to start going that direction? And uh, in every case, <clears throat> right, where this is business and personal, right? So same thing for when I almost wound up you know, having the divorce conversation. Version two, way better than version one. Like every time I've gotten to the, to the brink of failure, we stop, we reset, we realize, hey, this is not working. And we figure out how to move forward. And, uh, you know, I think understanding that failure is not a bad thing, right? And that's something I've, I've worked intentionally on for my kids, for the people that work for me. I'm, not, I'm never looking to blame anyone. I don't care whose fault something is, right? If a thing happens, it happens. Who cares? It happened. Assigning blame is not going to fix it. So let's figure out how can we improve it? How can we move on from there? And, uh, you know, I think once you've done that, over and over and over again, you stop looking at it as a bad thing. You start to realize, all right, it happened. Fine. Now let's deal with it and move forward. Yeah. When people ask me to define failure, I always define it with one word. Failure to me is fertilizer. That's all it is. It, it, it's learning uh, from what you did so that you don't repeat. And success to me is always about putting one foot in front of the other with a purpose. Right. That purpose is to take you forward. Of the, of the journey that you've had thus far, because you got a brighter journey in front of you, it, it, with the journey that you've had thus far, if, if someone was to ask you, hey, Jim, What's your top three keys to the success you've had? What would you tell them? Um, number one would be communication. You know, I think getting everyone on the same page and really understanding how communication works, not just making sure the other person has heard what you said, but they understand what you said. Uh, you know, because I think oftentimes we communicate just to say something and never really worry about how it's received. So really working on proper communication would be number one. Authenticity would be number two. Not being afraid to be who you are. You know, I see a lot of people who see other people be successful in a business or in whatever it is. And they try and copy exactly what they do and they forget that they're their own unique self. And no one can do a thing how you can do a thing because you're uniquely you. And everyone forgets that they want to just copy exactly what someone else does. And then they get upset when it fails because they're not that person. So understanding that you are your authentic self and, and really loving who you are and not being afraid to be who you are and right? having that, having that self-confidence 
who I think is tremendously important. Discipline would be number three, because, uh, you know, I think a lot of people get, they get stuck when they hit a point of frustration or failure or whatever it is. And they, they sit in their emotions a lot. And, uh, you know, I think emotions have a time and a place and there should be an emotional connection to everything you do, but you can't let emotions rule your decisions. If people wanted to reach out to Jim and ask him questions, how can they reach you? Uh, jimspelico.com would be probably the easiest option and then kind of go from there. But uh, you'll find me Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. I'm the only Jim Spelico there is. Uh, again, uniquely me, right? But uh, yeah, there's only one of me. So you'll find me anywhere you go. My number one law for life is why, be, why should I be a carbon copy when I'm the original? And there's only one of all of us until we give ourselves away to other people. And then we get lost in their design for our life. Yep. I like what you said today, guy. I appreciate it. This is, and I this appreciate been, uh, a I really appreciate time filling with us. combo. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, folks. Uh, into another of our episodes of Let's Talk Human Behavior. And uh, I hope that you'll take and replay this many times and listen to the wisdom uh, that Jim has shared with us. And we'll have his email address here uh, on the screen for you. And if you have questions or if there's anything you'd like to ask him or say to him, feel free, reach out to him. So until we get together again, remember my three words, behavior never lies. And make sure that whom you are is really the person that you are and the person you want to be, not someone you're trying to create in order to prove yourself or get other people to notice you, but to be able to say that I am me and I am living from the inside out and my behavior will prove that. I'll see you again very soon.